Hi, welcome back to Statistics One. We're up to Lecture 8, almost halfway through the course. And today, I'd like to introduce you to multiple regression. In the last lecture, we did simple regression, which is just one predictor in the regression equation. Today, we'll see how multiple, regress multiple regression works, where we have multiple predictors. It gets a little more complicated in terms of interpreting the regression coefficients, and mathematically, it gets a little bit more complicated. So I'll start out in the first segment just by introducing you to the multiple regression equation. And I'll present an example so you can get a flavor for how to interpret multiple regression coefficients in one example. Then in the second segment, I'll review some matrix algebra, because I'm assuming not everybody is familiar with matrix algebra, particularly matrix multiplication. And it's necessary to understand how matrix algebra works to understand how these regression coefficients are estimated sort of simultaneously in one equation. So then in the third segment, we'll take a closer look again at the regression equation and talk about how those regression coefficients are estimated. So let's start the first segment. In segment one, I'm just going to present one example, relatively easy example, so you can understand how to interpret the regression coefficients when there are multiple predictors in the equation. The important concepts to take away from this segment are, again, understanding the equation and the components of the equation, how to interpret the, both the unstandardized and the standardized regression coefficients, and then I'll talk about the difference between what I'll call a standard multiple regression, where we enter all predictors in together, and what I call a sequential multiple regression, where we enter predictors in a particular order. So in the last lecture, we talked about simple regression. We just had one predictor in the equation. Today, we're just going to enter in more predictors. So let's move to the equation. Uh, before, when we just did simple regression, that was our equation. We just had one predictor. So the predicted score on y was the regression constant, or the intercept, and the slope times an individual score on x. So that's just the, the formula for a line, uh, intercept plus slope, and that's simple regression. What we're doing now is we're going to add in as many predictors as we like. And as you can see, I could extend this out to k predictors. So I'll just summarize the multiple regression equation as follows. We're still going to have an intercept that's still the predicted score on y when the x's are 0. And then we can have multiple predictors and multiple regression coefficients. So again, the trick is trying to understand how to interpret multiple regression coefficients together, and mathematically, how does that happen? And that's what where well requires a little matrix algebra to fully appreciate. So this just breaks down everything that's in the equation. This should be obvious by now, the predicted value on y, the predicted value on y when all the predictors are 0, and so on. The other thing I alluded to last lecture and uh, we didn't really get into in simple regression is this idea of a model R and model R squared. I talked about this when I, I mentioned alternatives to null hypothesis significance testing and estimates of effect size. Right? If we want to compare models, for example, we want to look at model A's R squared versus model B's R squared. Now, this didn't really come up much in simple regression because the model was just one predictor. It was just that equation with one uh, regression coefficient in it. So the, the r squared was just the correlation squared. It was the correlation between x and y squared. That was your model r, and that was your model r squared. Now we can get a better correlation because we're adding in multiple predictors. And the way to get the model R is to just look at the correlation between the observed scores and the predicted scores. So that's the correlation between the observed scores Y and the predicted scores Y with a little hat over it. And then you just square that, and that gives you 
the percentage of variance in Y explained by the model. And we'll see that in an example. So I'm just going to walk through this example sort of conceptually, not terribly much detail mathematically. We'll get into that in the next segment. Uh, I want to introduce this example just so you get a flavor for how to interpret the regression coefficients and what the model R and R squared look like. So this is, an, uh, this is sort of an old example now, so uh, don't worry about the uh, faculty salaries if you're in academia and you're going into, uh, if you're on the job market particularly. Uh, I'm looking at someone who's on the job market. Um, these are old faculty salaries. Um, and we're going to predict faculty salary not from one predictor, but from multiple predictors. So one, how long has it been since the faculty member received his or her PhD? Uh, so you would think that the more years out, the higher their salary. So there's probably a positive correlation between those two. Um, the number of publications a faculty member has. That's often a predictor of how much money the faculty member makes because if a professor is very prolific and publishes a lot, then they tend to be more marketable, more sought after, and they probably make more money. And we'll also look and see if there's a gender effect. So we could look at male and female faculty members and see if there's a difference in their salary while taking into account, and this is the important part, while taking into account the time since their PhD and their number of publications. If we just wanted to look at is there a difference between men and women, we could just do a t-test, right? But here, we're taking into account these other variables, uh, so it gets a little bit more complicated in, in interpreting the gender difference. So here's some descriptive statistics for this example. Uh, as I said, this is, this is an old example. So there's 150 professors, and the average salary is 64,000. Uh, this is an old example. Uh, but they are relatively young professors, so the time since PhD is only eight years. It's funny, this example is so old that I used to think that was not a young cohort. <laughs> Um, now I think that is a young cohort, eight years since the PhD. Uh, and the average number of publications for this group of faculty members, again suggesting it's sort of a younger group, is uh, 15 publications on average. Now, but the question is how do these all predict faculty salary? Oh, before I get to that, I, we have to code our categorical independent variable uh, as numerical. So I can't just enter, obviously, I can't like tell R to run an analysis with males and females uh, just coded as string variables like that. We have, to, we have to convert them into numbers. So for this example, I just coded the male faculty members with zero and the female faculty members as one. And if you run this in R, this is the regression equation that you get out, and I'll walk you through all of this and show you where this comes from in R. But basically, the predicted score e equals 46,911. That's the regression constant. So that's the predicted score on Y when all the X's are zero. Well, that would be someone who just graduated, who has no publications, and is male. I coded male as zero. So a male professor with no publications just out of graduate school, we're predicting that professor would get about 46,911. Pretty low, but again, it's, it's sort of a meaningless uh, point because uh, it's for someone who, with no publications who's just getting out of grad school. Uh, then we can look at the slopes for each individual predictor. So for time since the PhD, it's $1,382. What that means is for every one unit increase in time, so for every one more year out of grad school, I predict another $1,382 in the faculty salary. How about publications? Well, for a one unit increase in publications, we predict about $500 more, or $502 to be exact. To be exact. And then for gender, that's the G out there, 
the coefficient is negative 3,484. Why is it negative? Because in this sample, the male faculty members are making more than the female faculty members while taking into account these other variables. So for a one unit increase in gender, that's going from zero to one, from male to female, we predict a drop in salary of $3,484. So let's look at the output that you would see uh, from any statistical software package or R will give you output that looks like this. I've organized it uh, a little bit so R won't look exactly like this. I've put the unstandardized and the standardized coefficients together in this table so we could get a feel for what they mean. What you see in the unstandardized column are all those numbers I just walked through in the previous slide. Those are the coefficients that go into the regression equation. That's how we get predicted scores on Y from a set of values on our set of predictors X1, X2, and X3. Time, publications, and gender. So we can just plug values in and get a predicted score. What we'll also see is the standard error associated with each regression coefficient. And that will give us a t-test and an associated p-value. That's the null hypothesis significance testing part. What that tells us is, is each one, of, each one of these predictors, are they significantly predicting salary or not? And what we see is for time, it is a significant predictor for publications. It is a significant predictor. Uh, that gender difference of 3,000 is not a significant difference uh, in this analysis. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not a difference between men and women in their salary. This is where it's important to think about how to interpret these coefficients. What that difference means is women in this sample are making $3,483 less than men, but while we're taking into account time and publications. What do I mean by taking into account? What I'm saying is the difference between men and women is 3,000 and change, assuming that the professors have all been out an average amount of time and assuming they're all publishing an average amount. That's a big assumption, and we could test whether or not that assumption is valid. So, for example, it, it might be that publications, maybe they matter more at the beginning of your career than later in your career. So maybe at the beginning, you have the slope relating publications to salary. Maybe it's steeper at the beginning than later. That would imply that time and publications interact to predict salary. We haven't tested that here. Right? All we're doing is testing the additive effects of each predictor. When we get past the midterm and we uh, go into mediation and moderation, we'll test other effects beyond these additive effects. But for now, it's important to remember what we're looking at here are the effects assuming the average level of every other predictor. So the slope for time is $1,382, but that's assuming an average number of publications. And it's assuming that the effects are additive. And we can test that later. So now onto the model R and model R squared. For this model, the correlation between the observed scores and the predicted scores is 0.513. If we square that, we get about 26% of the variance in faculty salary is explained by just these three variables. Now, that doesn't mean that these individual predictors are correlated that strongly, right? This, that's the beauty of multiple regression and building a model with multiple predictors, is we can account for more variance with this set of predictors and this, this, this particular linear combination of predictors than we would if we used any one predictor by itself. Uh, we can look back at the standardized coefficients to get a sense for how much each one of these predictors by themselves 
would explain in faculty salary. So it looks like time accounts for the most uh, amount of variance. That's because it's, it's standardized coefficient. It has the highest value in terms of absolute value. Uh, but again, now that we're in multiple regression, this is not the same as the correlation coefficient. So remember, in simple regression, the standardized regression coefficient was the same as the correlation coefficient. Now it's not, because this is the effect of time on salary, assuming an average number of publications and uh, taking into account males and females. Um, so this will not be exactly the same as the correlation coefficient. But all of those do give us estimates of effect size in a sense. So we can say that the effect of time on salary is stronger than the effect of publications on salary. And we can say something about the amount of variance explained in salary by this particular model. So the last thing I want to talk about in this segment is just the difference between two types of uh, approaches with multiple regression. One I'm referring to as just the standard. Another I refer to here as sequential. You may see this referred to in other places as hierarchical uh, regression. And I'm avoiding that term to avoid any confusion with things like hierarchical linear models, uh, which is a whole different type of analysis. So I'm just going to say sequential. And there are other types of approaches you could take as well. Another is stepwise. We're not doing that. Uh, I'm just going to talk about standard and sequential here. So it's important to know that if the predictors themselves are not correlated, then it won't matter how you run the regression, whether you run it standard or sequential or stepwise or whatever. Uh, if your predictors aren't correlated, if they're orthogonal to one another, then these different approaches won't matter. So if we take a, a Venn diagram uh, approach to thinking about the variance in all of these measures or all of our variables, again, I'm using y as the outcome variable. So assume that x1, x2, and x3 are three predictors they all account for a little bit of variance in y, but they're orthogonal to one another. They don't overlap themselves. Then this is real easy, and the math is real easy. Um, it won't matter which approach we take. But in these types of studies, where we're just doing observational studies here, we're not doing randomized controlled experiments, right? we're just doing observational studies, it's often the case that the predictors are correlated, like the faculty salary example. So time since PhD is probably correlated with number of publications, right? The more time you've been out of grad school, the more time you've had to publish. So there's a, probably a positive correlation there. So how do we untangle that positive correlation in trying to predict the outcome measure? That's where it gets more complicated, one, in terms of interpretation, and two, mathematically. So here's an example where things are correlated, uh, meaning the predictors are correlated. So x1 and x3 have a little bit of overlap, and x2 and x3 have a little bit of overlap. In the standard approach, we're just going to throw in all the predictors into one analysis, into one regression equation. And that's what I did with the faculty salary example. Each predictor will only get to sort of claim the variance in y that's unique to it. So uh, I'll show you that in the Venn diagram in a moment. But a way to think about that is the only, only the variance that's uniquely predicted by each individual predictor uh, is reflected in the regression coefficients. The overlapping areas where there's shared variance among the predictors and the outcome that's absorbed into the model R squared and the model R, but it's not assigned to each individual predictor. It's best to sort of look at that in a Venn diagram, at least for me. <laughs> um, some students get confused by this. Um, so 
if there's confusion on that, hopefully it'll, uh, you'll, you'll see this come through as we do uh, these analyses in R in the next lecture. Uh, but for a lot of students, this is helpful. So if we think about what gets assigned to predictor x1, in the regression equation, in the, what gets assigned to x1 is just the area unique to x1, so just a. That will be represented in the regression coefficient for x1. And likewise, for x2, just area E, and for x3, just area C, because those, those are the areas that are unique to each predictor. So that's what I'm doing by showing you out here. Those are the areas that will be represented or reflected in each individual predictor's regression coefficient. The model R squared will take into account the entire proportion of, var of variance that's shared with the entire set of predictors. So the model R squared will take up A plus B plus C plus D plus E. In a sequential regression, we as the researchers or as the experimenters, we will decide how to enter the predictors into the regression equation. So we may want to enter some variables first and other variables second. A common uh, example of this is you'll see demographic variables entered into a regression equation first and then sort of key uh, experimental variables entered in after that. Uh, so in this example, with the Venn diagrams, assume that I put variable x1 into the equation first. Then x1 gets to sort of soak up all that area in y. So x1 now gets a and b, because it got to go in first. It's sort of this privileged access. Then in step two, if we enter x2 and x3 together, then they're all in the equation, so it looks just like the standard. So x2 just gets area E, x3 just gets area C. Again, the model R squared will be the entire area that's overlapping between Y and the set of predictors that are in the model at that step. So it's step one, it's just A plus B. It's step two, it's all of those, A plus B plus C plus D plus E. Okay, that wraps up this segment. And again, the important things to take away at this point are just the idea of multiple regression, knowing the components of the equation, knowing how to interpret those coefficients, and we'll go through examples of this again, uh, not in the next segment, but in the last segment and in the next lecture, and actually in the lecture after that. So we'll do a lot of these examples. This is just the first one. So if this, this is still a little rough, don't worry. We're going to do lots of examples. Um, and then this idea of doing things sort of sequentially or just putting all of the predictors into an equation all at once together.